All right, so uh, this is my uh, sample editor that we're going to be teaching you. It's called Triumph, but let me just tell you a little bit about sample editing to begin with. So there's, uh, in the early days, uh, when we were first starting to do digital audio on computers, um, the hardware was so limited. Uh, the hard drives were very small, uh, the CPUs were slow, and we had very little RAM. Eight megabytes of RAM, you know, in a system or something, which was it's not very much, and it was really hard to do sound on a computer. But people were trying, um, and some of the early things that were able to do this. Uh, I mean, er early in the '80s, we were doing MIDI sequencing, uh, but that was really simple because there was no sound involved in that. Sound was all happening on external synthesizers, but inside the computer, it was just doing MIDI, and MIDI is nothing. So uh, that went on for quite a long time. But uh, in the mid early to mid-90s, we were starting to try to figure out how to edit actual audio on a computer. And because of the limitations of the hardware, the, um, these editors were what were called destructive editors. And it's because there was, the, the computers did not have the capacity to handle copies of the files, or it couldn't cache the whole thing in RAM. Um, which meant when you were operating on these audio files, you were actually altering the file. You were altering the bits. Um, and there wasn't, there was no undo, <laughs> right? If you, if you were gonna change the, the gain of it, for example, I mean, you were changing the gain. <laughs> you were multiplying every sample by 10. And, and there was really no going back. It was called a destructive edit. Uh, there, I mean, there was some going back. You could, they, you could say you could basically save a copy of the audio file on your hard drive and edit that, and then if you really screwed up, you could go back to the, whatever the original was. But it was largely a, what we would call a destructive process, and these were called sample editors. The reason they're called sample editors is from this. Uh, remember, we the things we were doing on computers to begin with was MIDI sequencing, and so what we were, later we were trying to do was figure <coughs> out how we could also uh, use samplers. So, you know, there were external outboard samplers, and samplers were these things that could record a real sound of something and map that to keys on the keyboard. Okay, so instead of doing a synthesizer, which was, you know, using tone generators and filters and things to create the sound of a violin, you could actually just record a real violin and have a digital recording of that, of each note assigned to different keys on the keyboard. And those were called samples, so each each note would be a sample, a sample note of, of a particular instrument. So what we needed was a sample editor, some ability to edit that thing, to trim it out, you know, to trim the beginning off of it so that it started right away, and um, trim the end off of it so it didn't cut off too abruptly, and you know, normalize the gain of all of them. And so it was very simple processes we were trying to do. We were just trying to trim things, trim the tops and tails, manipulate the level a little bit. Um, and tag it with some metadata. So we wanted to tag it with, you know, like loop points, um, and you know what the a little bit of metadata would say, you know, this is this is the pitch, and so on and so forth. So that then when you would load that into the little Akai sampler, it would read all that in. It would say, oh, this is this represents note C. So I'll put middle C, I'll put that on there, and you know, and this is where it loops and that kind of stuff. Uh, so we, there was the stuff we were trying to do was very very simple, um, and. DigiDesign came out with this thing called a uh, sound designer, which was largely not very useful. Um, it was completely destructive editor, uh, and, but it could, it could work. And, and then the second iteration of that, Sound Designer 2, is where they really, they really cracked it open. And, uh, and they, they were trying to, the, the thing was, how do we get it to be as non-destructive as possible, given the limitations of the hardware? So. One of the, the ways they did it was they said, well, you know, really, we don't have to edit the actual samples. I mean, we can, but we don't have to. So there's some things you could do where you wouldn't necessarily have to do that. So they invented this concept of a region. And they said, you know, if you could, yeah, you've got this audio file sitting on the hard drive, but really, we don't have to be manipulating it directly. We could just be looking at it from a different point of view. I mean, the concept of a region, the, I mean, if you think about, um, if you look out these windows at the back of the room, you know, what do you see? What do you see out, out of those three windows? Three. Big figure. 
mean, what's out there? What's out there behind us? <laughs> the film school, right? The film school is out there behind us. Well, so, you know, out of this window on the left, we can see the scoring stage, right? And out of the window in the middle, we can see stage six, and, at least from where I'm sitting. And over this window on the right, we can see uh, the, the tech ops shop, okay? Well, really, I'm not, it's not like those are three separate things, right? I'm just seeing them as three separate things because of the windows. Right? If, if, if I could blow out the wall, I would see it would all, see it would all be one picture. So that's, that's kind of the concept of a region. So the concept of a region was you could create these windows that would let you see different pieces of the audio file. Um, so you would create a, a marker at the beginning and a marker at the end, and that would represent a portion of that audio file. And you're just looking at it, and, you, and you're not paying attention to the other parts. You have another region that could pay attention to a different part of it, and so on and so forth. Well, once you had those, you could then mess with them in time, and you can move them around. You can make region two go before region one. You're never actually altering the file itself. You're just changing how the data gets read, right? You're just telling the computer, look, read this little bit first, then go to the beginning and get this other little bit, and then go get, you know. And it wasn't until you had that all strung together and then you could tell the computer, okay, now print that to a new file, or write that to a new file, or render it, essentially and it would make a new file out of that. And then the nice thing about that is it was just non-destructive, right? You weren't actually altering the real file. You were just sort of manipulating these arbitrary marker points and just saying, look, play this little bit, then this little bit, and then go back over here and get this thing good. And you weren't ever having to, to edit anything. So that was, that was a real groundbreaking uh, concept. And that, that program, Sound Designer 2, proved to be very useful, and it, and it survived for a very long time. It, what, I mean. Up until you know six or seven years ago, there were still some sound faculty over the film school that were still using it. Um, and at that point, it was fifteen, well, pushing twenty years old program, and because it was it was actually quite useful. Um, and so there's others out there that do similar things. So uh, there's a company named Bias uh, that took over from Sound Designer Two when DigiDesign dumped it, so that DigiDesign ultimately moved on and made Pro Tools. Um, and kind of gave up on Sound Designer 2, and then there's a company called Bias Incorporated that kind of picked up where Sound Designer 2 left off, and they made this program called Peak, which was a, a Mac sample editor. On the Windows side of things, uh, there was uh, SoundForge, they're still around. They make this, uh, uh, so the SoundForge tool is this editor. The, it, the company was the company, the company was Sonic Foundry, but now it's uh, Sony, I believe, owns it now. Um, but SoundForge was, you know, a, a Windows sample editor. There's other ones out there. There's this one called uh, Cool Edit Pro, which later became uh, Adobe Audition uh, when Adobe bought it out. Uh, and but th these are all examples of sample <laughs> editors. These are they're very different from something like Pro Tools and uh, Logic or Form or anything. So you don't usually record in these. These are not programs you use to record things. Uh, these are programs you use to edit things. And you, you're doing, you're using these programs to edit audio files. You're not using them to edit sequences or multi-tracks. Right? You know, it's, when you use a sample editor, you wanted to do something to an actual audio file. Whereas in Logic, you're maybe stringing lots of audio files together and mixing them and um, automating things. And you know, it, it's a very different thing. So, although the, today's sample editors are, are fairly non-destructive, the, the term non-destructive is used to describe in any kind of an editor that doesn't permanently alter the source file. Um, so like in logic, you can always go back to where you started very easy. Um, right? Anything that you, you do that re requires altering the file just makes a new copy of it and edits the copy. It does that all that automatically for you, and very quickly you do massive folder full of audio files that have been changed and edited. That's the non-destructive nature of it. So even today's sample editors, though, are, although we still call them sample editors, they're not true sample editors in the sense that they don't really alter the original file anymore. Uh, they're still very non-destructive. However, you use them for what we would typically call destructive tasks. Okay, So you use a sample editor for tasks that would involve manipulating the actual file. 
So let's say you have an audio file and you need to convert its sampling rate, normalize it to full volume, trim 10 seconds off the end of it, and then save it as an AIFF instead of a wave. Those are all things you would do in a sample editor. That would be much more efficient to do in a sample editor than to try to do that in something like Logic. So to do those kind of things in something like Logic, you'd have to like make a full session and um, automate some stuff, and it would, be, it would be a much bigger production than, than is really necessary. Um, whereas a sample editor is, is very is much stripped down. It's no, has nowhere near the kind of features that something like Logic or Pro Tools or Performer has. <coughs> So when you, when you have those kind of tasks where it's just like, I got a whole bunch of files, I need to convert the sampling into all of them. Or I need to, you know, I just need to convert them all from stereo to mono. <laughs> or I got to edit a little bit off of them. Or I just need to increase them all by 6 dB or turn them all down by 6 dB or something. Sample editors are awesome for that. Or maybe I've got a whole bunch of mono audio files and I want to collapse them all together into a single interleaved file that still is, has multi-channel. Uh, sample editor is really good at that. Logic can't actually do that. Um, but a sample editor can. And I'll show you that in a minute here. All right, so that's what sample editors do. The one that I'm going to teach you is called Triumph. Um, and it used to be called Wave Editor. And it's made by this company called Audiophile Engineering. Uh, and you know, the, so the, the, the big sample editor on the Mac for years was Peak, after Sound Designer 2 kind of fell apart. But Bias, who was making that, they went out of business a few years ago. And a few years before that, these guys, these couple of guys from uh, Audiophile Engineering, they made this company, and they, they thought, you know, we want to reinvent the sample editor um, and kind of rethink some of the paradigms of it. So they made this thing called Wave Editor, and it did fine. And now they, they've kind of done Triumph, and it's, it's kind of the version 2 of this thing. So that's why Triumph is technically it's in version 2.5, but there was never a Triumph version 1, because version 1 was Wave Editor. Okay, So that's where that comes from. Uh, you can get this. Uh, I'll show you. Uh, there's a couple ways to get this. You can go audiophileengineering.com. Uh, and it's not a real expensive program. Um, so here's Triumph, and you can get it for $79. Um, you can buy it straight from Audiophile, or you can also get it on the App Store, um, the Mac App Store, for the same price. Um, it's really the same program either way. Um, it just depends on whether you want to go through the App Store or through them. Uh, you can buy it if you want. You don't have to. I've got it on the computers in the lab here, um, and you're welcome to use it there. You can down if you download the demo from Audiophile's website. I think it runs for 15 days uh, on your computer. So if you wanted to just get you through the next couple of weeks of uh, doing this project on your computer without having to buy it, you could. But after that 15 weeks, it stops being useful. Okay. So um, if you want to do that, I do have um, a few uh, licenses of it through the school's Mac, Mac App Store that I, that I haven't assigned to anything. I, I can loan those out to students temporarily if you've got a project or something that you need to do and you don't have the money to buy the Triumph or whatever. I do have a few that I can shoot out to people. It's, it, would, it, it would just be for a temporary kind of thing, maybe for a semester or something, and then I'll pull it back. Um, and that's all automate, automatic. So if for some reason you need that, I'm happy to, to do that. All right, so let me show you how it works. Uh, let me just get rid of this thing. Well, actually, I'll leave it. Uh, so, one of the one of the changes they made in this version two is they is it's all one window now. So everything is, is done in this single window. Uh, and so down here in the bottom, uh, in this first tab, you have this is called your I don't know your resources or your source files. So any of your source audio files that you've pulled in here that you want to play with. Uh, and I just have this one. And then up here, they have your layers. So what they did is they, they kind of stole this layers idea from, some, if you've ever used something like Photoshop, um, there's this concept of layers, right, where you've got um, different elements of your image that exist on different layers, and you can implement them, you can, or you can manipulate them all separately, but ultimately they show up together until you flatten it, right? And you flatten it into a, an image. So they took this concept of layers and flattening from image-based image editing, and they're trying to implement it in audio-based editing, which is kind of interesting. I'm not sure I totally buy it, but 
uh, but I get it. I mean, it works. Um, so you've got layers. You have your master layer, which is like everything. And then uh, you can have multiple layers here, uh, and you're editing them all separately. And then over here across the top, you can choose which layer is active. So right now, I've just got this one. So I've, I've dragged this audio file in here, and it's made a new layer for it. Let me play it. Uh, there's some other tabs down here where you had your, uh, your resources. Your second tab here, these are your plugins. Uh, so this would be uh, any um, plugins that you might have, like audio unit plugins. Are those default with the purchase? Uh, some of them are. So um, let me, I can sort by uh, manufacturer. So there are some audio units that come with, with uh, the Mac. I mean, that every Mac just has that Apple just makes. Um, so that's what these you know, Apple ones are. Audiophile engineering ships some of their own in here. Um, and then I have the Waves uh, Diamond Bundle on here. And we have Diamond Bundle dongles here on the wall that you can use on the lab workstations. And that gives you a bunch of extra ones, too. Um, but that audio unit is the plug-in format for the Mac. Uh, you, buy, you buy these. So that native power pack that I had you guys quote for the project, that's an audio unit bundle. It also, But it also works in a couple other formats. You can get it in DirectX format or VST or all MAS, which are just different plug-in formats for different audio suite, which is the DigiDesign. But audio unit is the native plug-in format for Mac, and that's what these guys are using. So uh, it, yeah, it comes with a bunch. And then if you want more, you can buy more from third-party developers. Uh, this other tab is your fades. So there's different sorts of fades you can do. Um, lots of different kinds. But I'll show you those in a minute. Uh, this other tab are your markers. Um, so this is metadata that you can use, that you can just tag your. So there's the, here's the concept of a region. So I could drag a region onto here, and I've just defined a region. And a region is nothing more than a start point and an end point. Uh, but then I can do something with it. So I've got it now, and you know, I could double click it and I could select it and I could do something with that region. What do? Anything you want. Any process you would want to do on that portion of audio, you can do it. Um, you could make a whole list of regions and then create what we'd call an edit list, um, which would be this smart edit list here. And you could string a whole bunch of regions together here and actually edit a whole song there without ever actually cutting anything um, just by jumping regions around. In, in logic, that's what you're doing, by the way. All those little things you're pushing around in logic on the timeline, those are regions. And over on the left, on the right side of the screen is your actual audio files. And if you open them up, you have the, like, the name of the audio file, and you collapse the triangle, and you get a list of all those other things under it. Those are all the regions that are defined for that audio file. Okay, So even the multi-track editors use this concept now of a region. Uh, but you can do other things, too. Uh, you can do. There's other kinds of metadata. For example, you can do a loop. Uh, and when we get when we start learning about samplers, I'll teach you loops. But this is the basic idea. Um, let me show you. Right. And I can kind of manipulate this. Right, so uh, you can manipulate those start and end points, and those are just markers. And what'll happen is you could then dump that into a sampler, and it'll read that, it'll read those markers, and play back that loop. How like precise can you get with those markers? Really precise, like down to the sample level. That's what's going on down here. So this area that opened up here, what you're seeing is the actual overlap um, between the, two, the the loop points. So if I kind of drag this around, you can kind of see this is how it's going to overlap. And you can then nudge it by zero cross points to get it to be just perfect. <laughs> so what we're seeing in the center of that screen is the end and the beginning of the wave. Yep, exactly. So here's where it ends, and then the loop starts back up over here. And you can kind of see as you nudge it, you can nudge it on a sample by sample basis to get it to be exactly what you want to remove the click, right? Yeah. Um, so really useful for setting loop points. QLab will read those loop points. Right? If you if you set those loop point markers in here and then render that out, QLab will read them in as slices in QLab. Only up to 0.01. Yeah. 
Hmm? Only up to like point zero zero one. What do you mean? Two left. It can't read markers like super super uh, like anything past like three decimal places. Because like logic does four, I believe. You can actually have like four in logic, but when you go over to Q left, it removes a decimal, so it rounds. Yeah, but you can't drop you can't drop marker points in logic though. Which you can. Using their sample editor, you mean? In logic, yeah. You can drop marker points in logic. I've done it. In the in the arrange window? Uh, up top, it's above the audio bar. Yeah, that's in, that's that's a different thing. So, so that's a precision issue with logic. So logic is actually tagging that marker not to the sample, but to the timeline. This is tagging it to the sample. So this is sample accurate marker, whereas, whereas logic is just doing it based on a timeline. Okay, but remember, we're, we're editing samples here. So this is very precise. I've never had any problems with, with these drifting when you, when you move them between different programs because they're tagged to the sample. Uh, so that that's just there, and there's all different kinds of, of tags you can put in here, tracks and indexes. That that has to do with CDs um, and things like that. We'll go over that on Friday. And then the last tab here, these are uh, uh, actions. So uh, anybody familiar with Apple Script at all? A couple of you. So it's a scripting language that's built into the Mac. Okay, um, and Triumph is 100% Apple scriptable, and yeah. And so all of their little processes here are actually Apple scripts. <laughs> and so they give you some. So for example, uh, let's find a simple one. Change gain. So you, if you open this up, you can actually say copy script to clipboard. And then you can just open up a text editor here, paste it in. And there it is. Um, there's the Apple script to change the gain of your audio. And so what's really cool is you can actually create your own scripts, right, that do your own little process. So like I have some that I've made um, in here. Let me see if I can find them. Here's my custom ones. So I, I created some when I was doing 100, 101 Dalmatians that would, do, that would render my audio in different formats because depending on who I was sending it to, because like the choreographer wanted one thing, and the music director wanted a different thing, and I needed something different than all of them, and I needed to be able to really quickly uh, convert them to different things. And so I made my own little scripts that would do it and automatically save them to specific folders. So if you look at like my, uh, my 101 Dalmatians render wave, here's the script that I made. Um, so I'm saying, tell application triumph to set the folder to fall staff, which is the name of my hard drive, Dalmatians cast recording final renders. So I'm saying, Render it, and this is the folder I want you to put it in, so I don't have to like tell it manually how to do that. So I just click that button, and it'll render this workspace as a WAV file and dump it into that folder uh, automatically for me. And I, you know, I don't know a whole lot about Apple Script. I'm no Apple Script genius. I, I've got some books. I'm trying to get better at it. But all I did was I took one of their existing render uh, things, and I pulled up, pulled it up, and I just read it and kind of tweaked it to get it to do what I wanted it to do. Um, QLab, by the way, does. Fully Apple scriptable as well. You could write an Apple script that would import an audio file into Triumph, do a bunch of stuff to it, render it out, load it up into QLab, set the levels for the cross points in QLab, and then play it. You could theoretically if you wanted to. Uh, so anyway, that's so that, that's what these are. These are all different Apple scripts that do stuff, um, and you can also get them up here in the Actions menu. Okay, so when you make them, they show up here in the actions. Here's my custom ones. So like I made this one, this this render all, and I actually mapped it to a F19 hotkey, and the render all would give me all those different formats all at the same time, all organized into folders. <laughs> so here it is. So I'm saying final renders wave, final renders AAC, final renders MP3, um, and I would just click one button, and it would take all this stuff render them in three different formats, and organize them into three separate folders automatically. And I put it on a hotkey. <laughs> and so <laughs> every, this was I made these for the cast recording we did. So every time I'd finished a track of the cast recording, I would just hit F19, and it would go boom, <laughs> and blast it out into all the different formats, tagged and organized and everything. Uh, very helpful. OK, so you can make your own. That's, the, that's a really cool thing about 
this particular sample editor. All right, so that's what's going on over here. Uh, up in the middle here, you have your kind of overview, uh, and this shows you the entire uh, layer, okay, or the entire works, what they call workspace, because uh, you could potentially zoom in closer here uh, in your waveform view, and on the overview, you're seeing in, in gray the parts that aren't visible in the waveform. So the white area is what I'm seeing down here. And then you can go in and drag this around. Okay, you can take that, that selected area and move it around up in the overview and get to that part down in the waveform editor. And then there's you know different things you can do in the waveform editor. I'll show you in a minute. Uh, smart edits. So this is the concept of a smart edit is kind of a, a child of, of the region. So audio file engineering took this concept of a region and kind of souped it up a little bit into this thing called a smart edit. And a smart edit is a little bit swankier than a region. Um, it has some extra functionality, uh, and you can manipulate it in a few different ways. Um, I haven't found it to be, maybe it's just because I haven't quite figured out what they're trying to accomplish with it, but it, I guess it works. Um, but it makes it makes it behave much more like regions behave in uh, a multi-track editor like Logic. Is essentially what they're trying to do is they're trying to make it be these things that you can click and drag and move around, which is not particularly useful for me because I have Logic for that. Uh, okay, down below that you have your loop editor, which is where you can get really really fine level of detail over loop points. And I don't know what destination is. I've actually never used that. I don't know. One of you could look that up, I suppose. I've never, it's never, need, I've never needed it, obviously, because I've never used it. Okay, uh, and you can kind of close out the ones you don't want. You can just collapse them. Uh, then over here on the right, you have, uh, these are all of your uh, markers that are associated with the file. So I have uh, a loop and a marker that has the tag of the song that this is. And you could have a whole bunch of these. Uh, this is any metadata that you would you could tag onto this thing. So uh, different file formats will tag different bits of metadata. So this is where like you could enter in like the song title and the album title if you're going to like dump this out to iTunes or something, um, or even uh, anything to do if you're going to like put the root pitch in or the key span that you want this thing to go into. If you're going to put it into a sampler to play back on a keyboard, you can put in that metadata here. But this one here is, is analysis, so you can, uh, I'll show you, I can do it, run an analysis on this. If Over here in my layers view, if I click this little triangle, um, it gives me some information about the layer, and there's this option to analyze that layer. And what it does is it kind of goes through and takes a look at it, and then it'll tell you some stuff about it. So it'll say, okay, well, it starts at this point, ends at this point, here's the sampling rate. Um, this is when it was created. It tells you uh, the peak amplitude. So it, it went and found the, the, lap, the highest value sample and said that that, that sample is minus 7.53 dB full scale. That's the loudest peak. Um, the RMS level of this track is oh, the track. Is the, region. the track. So well, the whole layer basically. So this whole whole song beginning to end. The RMS level of it is minus 23.94. Um, how can you adjust that? How can you adjust the RMS level? No, just bring the whole thing up and down. Well, you, you could, if you want, if like, so let's say that, so I see that the peak is minus 7.53, and I say, well, that's, so I've got potentially 7.5 dB of headroom I'm not using, right? So I could normalize this thing and get, get it 7.5 dB louder. Just because, just by taking that loud a sample and making that be zero and turning everything else up accordingly. Um, but if you if you're interested in like gain structure, for example, of your system, uh, it'll tell you what the RMS level of this particular cue is. <laughs> so if you want to know how much headroom do I need in my system to play this cue at a certain level, um, you know my RMS value here is minus twenty three point nine four, and the peak is seven and a half. So well, there's a dB difference between there. And you know what it is. It's like 14 something, which means you would need 14 dB worth of headroom in your system in order to not clip this thing to play it at the level you want it. Okay, That's, so it just does the RMS math for you. That's just one thing it does. Um, 
Crest factor. Remember the crest factor from last year? Crest yep. factor. It'll tell you what the crest factor is, 6.61. Um, anyway, it, so it just, it's some interesting, useful information. I find that helpful sometimes. Uh, and so any, any analysis you've done on files will show up in here. You can have lots of analyzed data here. Uh, let's see. This one, I believe, yeah, these are all your renders. So anytime you render something, it'll show up over here in this one that looks like a document. And that's, you know, that's finished stuff. Um, and then you can save it from there if you want. And then this is actually, I believe this runs burns. So you can actually use this to do uh, Redbook standard CD mastering. Uh, and these days, even with computers that don't have CD drives anymore, you can do, you can render it to what's called a DDP file set, which is if you ever wanted to send something off to be mass produced by a, a firm that makes CDs, they, they don't actually want you to send them a CD. <laughs> they want you to send them a DDP file set, um, which is this file, standard file format that you can upload to them through the internet. And then they can make a, a CD out of that. They can make you a million CDs out of that. Okay, so this thing will make those DDP file sets uh, out of that, and that will show up here in Burns. Um, okay, let me see if I can find you a slightly more complicated document here. When you, um, when you initially brought in that file, how did you do it? Yeah, so that's what I'll show you here in a second. Um, okay, here's one. So here's something a bit more complicated. So this was, I had, uh, I created one document here for all my sound effects in 101 Dalmatians. And I have separate workspaces. So over here across these tabs are different workspaces for different things. So here's the one that's just a doorbell. Um, and so these are all the audio files that I pulled in, but ultimately I, I edited this down to be just doorbell. So I did some work on that. I, I trimmed it a little bit. Um, I also had uh, this camera which is when they were taking pictures of the kids. And I edited that down a little bit. Here's my thunder. And notice my thunder is multi-track. So I've got four channels in there. And that'll render down to four channels. I'll show you that in a little bit. So, what's that? How is it, uh, when you say workspaces, what? So that's what's going on here. These tabs over the top right. are separate workspaces. Um, so ultimately, uh, everything gets dumped into one file, but uh, just for organizational purposes, you can organize different kinds of things into workspaces. So I'm using the workspaces to be different sound effects for the show. So if I'm working on Thunder number two, I'm going to do that in this particular workspace. And I can tweak that and everything without ever having to mess up my camera that I'm working on over here. So it's just like, and I'm going to relate it back to a lot of things that's already in the email, but like how we can just keep extending it out to the right to like 1,000, 2,000. To buy us more room to work with, that's kind of like a um, workspace. Yeah. Wouldn't it be more like just five or six things you're working on at the same time? Yeah. Helpful. Yeah, because the issue with what you're talking about with logic, all the plugins still apply to that track, even though you're right. 100 hours in the future. Yeah, they do. Right? But this is like totally separate things. Yeah. So there's nothing in common with these other than they're all bundled into the same uh, wave editor document. So instead of having, you know, 20 different wave editor files, I just have one for all my sound effects. I see. It's like multi-take. Yeah. It's kind of like multi-takes. But even with multi-takes, the, again, the plugins are shared. Yeah. Um, but this is... Five different... Think of this as like five completely different projects. And can any part of it, if you liked, let's say you like this part of one, can you... Bring it over to another? Sure, yeah. You can move it over to another workspace if you want to. You just copy and paste it. Um, but these are treated like separate things. Okay. And really, I'm just, you can see, I'm doing very simple edits on, on here. Like, here's the truck that I pulled in. And all I did is I trimmed the, the top of it because it was too long. And I put a fade in on it. So this is not where you make your masterpiece. All right? You make your masterpiece in logic. And then you pull it into here to tweak it, you know, to put it in whatever format you need it to actually play it, right? So this is where you get it, you shorten it, you gain it just right, you, you know, whatever you've got. These are very simple processes you're doing on these, are not you, significant things. Are you saying that you don't like the way Logic bounces different file types, I guess? 
No, that's fine. But what I'm saying is logic is all this information all at once. And so what you're going to do is, yeah, you bounce it down, you have it there, and now you, need to, now you need to take that file and get it into the format you need to actually play it. And that might, you might have like some leading silence or something that you don't want, that you got to trim out. Um, and you know, maybe you need to layer it separately. Because for example, uh, one thing logic does not do is do multi-channel bounces. It'll do a, it'll do a 5.1 surround bounce but if you want to do multi-channel interleaved bounce where you have different elements on different channels it won't do that uh, so what you have to do is bounce it down as individual mono files each track is a separate mono file and then you pull it into something like this to string it together into an interleave file that you can manipulate live okay uh, so for example that's what I'm doing over here with the thunder so here with the thunder I have two different thunders. Um, I'll play you the first layer. So these are two of my thunder recordings I did. So this is the one that really close. It's, it struck like 100 yards away from me where I was recording this one. And then there's this one that's, that's further away. Okay. So in reality, I want both of these for this particular effect. And yeah, I could take those both into logic, and I could put them on separate tracks and bounce them down as one mixed thing. But then I couldn't manipulate them separately in the space when I get into the theater. Oh right, because yeah. you don't need conversations in this part. I do. Yeah. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually I've, I've I'm using my channels list here, and I've made four channels in this particular workspace. And I've got the first layer on channel one and two, and the second layer on channel three and four. And then what I do is I bounce that down to a single wave file. And here it is. So here's my rendered file. And let me just, I'll go ahead and save it to my desktop here. Actually, I'll just put it on the external here. And then I'll show you what happens when you pull this into Logic. Or into, not Logic, into QLab. So here's QLab. And here's my Thunder 1. And we'll talk more about QLab later, but uh, now if we go to our uh, levels thing here, look at that. I got four channel input now, as opposed to just two. So I've got my close thunder channel one and two, and my far thunder th channels one and two. What is the and I can matrix these out. So you don't have to, you know, this is where you don't need sound groups anymore, and you don't need, you can all be one file. Yeah, <laughs> and you can take that to go even further. So let me show you, for example, um, let's see. I'll just do this one again. This is the whole show of 101 Dalmatians. Um, so we had pre-recorded music on this. And... Uh, Wait, this is the new one. Let me find the old one. Do this one. There we go. Okay, so I this was all canned music, and I have each instrument on a separate track. <laughs> So I can mix it live in the space. So uh, output five was my monitor feed for the singers. And output four was my reverb send. And then this was sort of my mains. This way I could give a separate mix of the music to the singers than the audience was hearing. Uh, I couldn't do that if I bounced it all down to one file in Logic. Right? What's the limitation on QLab for inputs? I think it's... 48. It's either 24 or 48. I forget. I think it's. I think it's 48. Yeah. But you have to. But you, they have to be these interleaved multi-channel files that Logic can't make. Those files that you have right there are, are those. Okay. So the previous window you had up was two files 
that you bounce that Romano thunders into Triumph, and then you end up with four tracks. Mm -hmm. Is that a left, right? I guess for like worst. Like, like, no, it makes a four-channel file. Okay, because it, it is. So, just like you can have a mono wave file or a stereo wave file, you can have an eight-channel wave file or a twenty-channel wave file. But you only had two audio files, like things in that particular way. No. Or did you put four in that one? Well, there's two, but the, each of them have two channels in them because it's a mid-side, mid-side. Oh, okay. So there were okay. Yeah. So I'm getting four out of it. So I'm making a single audio file that actually has four channels worth of data in it. So if you look at this Thunderfoot, it's one file. It's one audio file. Yeah, no, I, right? I get that. That wasn't the problem. I was curious if you that why there were four, because I thought it was only two. Oh, right. Well, because it's two channels per file. Okay. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's just one example of something you can do with sample editor, is you can, you can, crea you can create multi-channel interleaved audio files. And that's not something that you know a sequencer knows how to do, like Logic or Pro Tools, because their whole thing is mix downs. I mean, that's all they care about is what you're mixing down. And we hate mixing down in theater. Right? This is why we like people to build mixing consoles that have more outputs than inputs, because we hate mixing things down. It drives us nuts. Okay? Uh, we would like to keep it not mixed, because when we go to a different room, it needs to be remixed. And we need to put this thing out of that speaker, and this thing out of that speaker, and the other one out of the speaker behind us. And, you know, so we hate mixing stuff down. Uh, and so I don't, I don't ever bounce things down in Logic that are mixed down. I always export them out as separate things and put them in an interleaf file and load it up in QLab, and then I mix it in the space. It's much more interesting that way. But you have to have something like this to do it. You can't do it in Logic. Um, OK, so these are just some examples of, of, of some things you can do. So let me take you through um, some very, very simple functions now. I'm just showing you how you might do something in Logic. And this is using um, one of my little demos from the book. Um, I'm going to, at the same time I'm teaching you Triumph, I'm going to also teach you a little bit about why MP3s are a bad idea. Okay, so I have uh, two versions of the same sound here. So I'm going to take them, drag them in to my workspace. Okay, so I just, I've got an MP3 version and a wave version. Okay, so I've dr dragged them over here to my little sources thing. I'll start with the uncompressed, and I'll drag it up here to make it a, a layer, and then I'll play it. Okay, so short little thing. So that sounds fine. That, that's straight off the CD. Okay, that's uncompressed. No, no funny business going on. Okay, now let me take the MP3. I'll throw this that in. So now I've got that on a separate layer. I'll turn off the uncompressed version. So now all we can hear is the MP3. And let's listen to the MP3 of this. So, you know, if you pay really close attention, you might be able to hear a few differences there, but they're subtle, okay? There's quite a few. So but, there's a depth in the other one. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's definitely a difference. But for casual listening, if I was just going, you know, if I just was going to listen to this for fun on my in my car or whatever, I th that MP3 would be fine because you know the listening environment is awful in your car anyway. Um, and unless you've got good trained ears, you may not even hear the difference. Most average people, we can hear the difference, but most people couldn't. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to try to show you now is why you really don't want to work with these as your as your source files for stuff. Okay. MP3s. Yeah, <laughs> which you guys do all the time, and it drives me nuts. It's like I show up to shop bills and you got MP3s loaded up in QLab, trying to play them, and I'm like, why are you doing that? So here you go. Here's what we're going to do. I've got my uncompressed version. I'm just going to run a couple of simple processes on it, okay? Uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run a subtraction process on this. 
And subtraction is essentially where you subtract the right from the left. So I'm going to sum this thing to mono, uh, but I'm going to invert the polarity on one channel before I do it. So uh, there's a, to do this, I'm going to need a couple little extra options turned on. Uh, over here at the top of my waveform view, you see the little gearbox? Okay, right here, gearbox. Where my mouse oh, is, gearbox. Yep. Yes, click that, and this. Anytime you see that gearbox, there's one for each of these little windows. It'll give you the options for that window, like what can you do with that particular uh, pane, and uh, it's just different, like how data gets displayed, what what is it going to snap to, so on and so forth. If you go here to more, uh, you can. I'm going to turn on allow separate channel selection. That'll allow me to select the left and the right separately from one another. Otherwise, because by default it does them together. Um, and smart edits will let you edit channels separately, which I also want to do. Not so much for this one, but usually I like that option better. Um, so what what happens is if you're going to uh, if if you don't have that on, you could have one side selected, and you could then run a process on it, and it'll run on both channels. Okay, so this is just lets me be very specific about how I want to edit stuff. So I'll turn that on first. Okay. Now I've got my left, and I can select that separately from my right. You see how I'm able to select them separately? All right, so that's really useful now. So now what I want to do is invert the polarity of one of these. It doesn't matter which one. And there's a few ways to do that. The simplest way is if I just kind of hover over the bottom right of this, I get this little pop-up. And that's true of pretty much anything in Triumph. Hovering over the bottom right of it gets you one of these. Right? So here's I get it over here in my layers view, and I can pull up some options for the layer. Same thing over here, pull up some options for that MP3, it'll tell me some stuff about it. So pretty much anything will give you that little disclosure triangle. So I open that up, I have this option to invert polarity, and it used to say invert phase, and I was on the beta test team for this, and I said, you can't say phase, because it's not phase, and they changed it for me. I was very, very excited. <laughs> so it says polarity, because I made it so. <laughs> I was very excited about that, because they finally listened to me when I said that. So anyway, I click that, and that just inverts the polarity. Okay, and you can see that it's only changing the, the bottom right one. Okay, so just all I did is invert the polarity. Uh, so now what I can do is I can sum this thing to mono. So I'm going to go up to my actions here, and I'm going to select flatten because I'm going to flatten this layer. So flatten current layer to a new layer as a mono file. So it's, it's currently stereo. I want to make it mono and put it in a new layer. Okay. So I click that. And there, it makes me a new layer now called uncompressed.wave-mono. And if I turn off my original layer, here's what, I was, here's what I'm left with, which is obviously something much quieter because we just canceled out most of the data, right? Because the, it was inverted. So all we're getting now is whatever was unique in each channel is what's left here. Okay, so it's very quiet. I'll go ahead and normalize this so that it, you know, we can hear it because it's very quiet now. Uh, yep. Yeah. So everything that was, are we talking like discrete and discrete? Is that what we're you're talking? About? So, what, so because I inverted the polarity on one channel, I summed it to mono, and anything that was the same in both channels gets canceled out because the polarity was inverted. So the stuff that's the same is basically the stuff that's in the phantom center of the stereo image. Right? To make something yeah. show up in the phantom center, you have to put it in equally in both. So anything that was in the center, I just canceled out. So that's discrete? Yeah. Right? I guess. I don't know. I don't know what you're referring to. Trying to get... Trying to relate this to the mid-side thing. Yeah, I mean, this is this is one of the things you would do to make mid-side, but we, we're not there yet. Uh, all right, so now I'm going to normalize it. So I'll go to Actions again, and I'll find that under Process. And there's different options for normalize. You can normalize to minus 0 0.1 dB, which, I don't know, some people like that because they're afraid of 0. I'm not sure why. Um, you can normalize to 0, or you can normalize to some any level you want, right? So if you check just regular normalize, it'll say, OK, normalize to what level? Um, and you can normalize based on maximum, peak, or RMS level. RMS level tends to produce clips. Just <laughs> If you normalize to RMS, zero, uh, 
you'll get an awfully distorted file, <laughs> just FYI. So I'm going to do normalize to zero, maximum. There we go. All right, so let's take a listen to this thing now. This is, I've, I've canceled it out, normalized it. Now we have all the stuff that was unique in both channels. Okay, so it's all the echoey, reverby stuff and all that wind that was pushing around back and forth. Okay, so no big whoop. Great, we just did a thing, right? We made something sound different. Should we do that kind of stuff all the time? Let's try and do the same thing with the MP3. Okay, now remember what's happening with MP3 is they're trying to figure out how, how much of this can we get rid of and have it still sound like the original thing? Right? How, much, how, much, how much of this can we delete and have your brain still put it all back together? So it took quite a bit out of it. And if we look at the difference here, if we run an analysis of these two, so let me analyze this one, and then I'll analyze the MP3, we can see that the uncompressed See if it'll tell me the actual file size here. Well, I thought it would in here. I guess it doesn't. Well, I can get it over here. So the uncompressed is 3.8 megabytes, and the compressed version is only 336 kilobytes. Okay, so there's a lot less data in that MP3. Okay, but it sounds pretty close to the same thing. We, and we could hear some differences, but by and large, it sounded the same. All right, so let's do some, let's do the same process now on the MP3. I'll invert the polarity of one channel, right? Just inverting it. I'll do that same action that flattens, flatten current layer to new layer as mono. Okay, so now here's my compressed mono one. And I'll normalize that one now, too. Process normalize to 0 dB. Now let's hear what we get out of our MP3. Yeah. OK. So what's happened, that's, that's all, those are all errors. All, of, all that junk is all errors that was the result of us trying to mess around with this thing. Um, because most of the data isn't there. A lot of that stuff that we were hearing before is gone. That's how they made the file so small. So we start now trying to get at it. So what we're, you know, let's say what the reason for doing this is we wanted to get at, the, at all of the little rustly, windy stuff. We wanted to isolate that somehow and use it for something else. So we're going to can't try to cancel out as much of the other crap as we can, and then we get just the wind. Um, well, what this is showing us is that most of that wind that we were hearing in that MP3 file wasn't actually there. We were hearing it, but it wasn't really there because most of it had been removed as part of the compression pro algorithm, and our brain was sort of fooling ourselves into thinking it was there, even though it wasn't, because we had, there was enough of the pattern left that we could put it together. But the second we try to get a hold of it, we can't get it, because it doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 you hear, there's all kinds of things you hear in MP3s that aren't actually there. Okay. What, what, what causes us to perceive that it's there? Well, so the, 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 the operating theory here is that um, you uh, you know what stuff sounds like, yeah. okay? So you know what wind sounds like. You've heard wind before, uh, and point of fact, I played you the original to begin with. I didn't play the MP3 first. I played the, the original first. Uh, so what they're trying to do is they'll say how much of that sound, whatever the pattern is, the, the the harmonic makeup or whatever that makes that thing sound like that, how much of that pattern could we disrupt, and have your brain still identify it? So in the same way that you can look at 24 still shots in a second and perceive it as a continuous image, you can have a fragment of the pattern of a sound of a certain thing 
and your brain will fill in the rest of the pattern that's missing because it knows what it's supposed to sound like. Okay, um, there's enough of it there that your brain says, "Oh, that's wind." Great. I will perceive that as wind, despite the fact that most of it's not there. <laughs> uh, is so, that, is that based, just for argument, mm -hmm. uh, is that based on experience? So, if we had a child, right, that we could identify, you know, communicate with, would they hear it differently? Well, that there's a, that's really interesting, and there's been some research done on that. I don't know if I was this class I told this to or the last class, but um, so the there, there have been some tests, some research done, uh, A/B testing of, of MP3 versus uncompressed with with young people, um, and and the younger generation says they think the MP3 sounds better, and it's like, what do you mean it sounds better? And the the theory is that you know here here are kids that maybe have never really heard. You know, a recording of an actual instrument. I've never been to a live concert, so maybe they don't really know what this stuff sounds like. And maybe their only exposure to it is an MP3. So it's quite possible that they might be hearing something very different from what the rest of us are hearing because they don't have that point of reference. Um, it's difficult to prove that because it boils down to perception. Uh, but yeah, it, there, there could be something to that. Uh, because it is dependent on your identification of patterns. So the, the question here is how much of that pattern identification is inherent to our nature and how much of it is based on pre or prior experience? I don't know. Um, it's, probably a, it's probably a mix of both. Uh, but we've, sh I mean, we've shown here, we've been, able to, we've been able to expose the fact that most of that stuff was gone, right? Because we tried to isolate it and we get all these errors that we can't find it. Uh, so this is just, you know, that's why we, why we don't work with MP3s. It's fine if you want to listen to them casually, um, but if you want to actually do any serious work, you really need to go back to the source file. All right, so that's just, I mean, I was showing you something in MP3s, but really I was trying to teach you how to edit stuff in Triumph, okay? So you can sort of see maybe how you might do some of those kind of things. Uh, let me show you some other ideas here. I'll make a new workspace here. Clicking this little plus button, you can make a new workspace. Uh, let's see something else I might want to do. Uh, let me go back to my hard drive here. And let me get, let's see. Okay, so here's um, here's just a thing that the orchestrator sent me for this show that I was doing. Um, it's just a stereo file. There we go. Dragged it in. All right, so you've got this little uh, thing here. This is your playback bar, so you, you move this to get it to go anywhere. Where your cursor is isn't necessarily where it's going to start playing. It starts playing where this this thing is. All right. So I don't know what's something I might want to do to this. So maybe maybe this is too long, <laughs> right? And we got to shave a, a little bit of time off of it. Uh, well, you know, I don't really want to go back and do a whole big logic production off of this. I could I could just go in and trim this up. There's a couple ways to do it. I could just take this little handle here and just trim it real quick. Maybe not quite that one. Something like that. Put that in. Drop a quick fade on. Actually, you can do a real easy fade by just dragging this top handle. Okay. And then I can do a quick render on that and dump it out. Okay, so I can. Uh, they changed the renders now. This new version. Um, you can go here and build your own little render script. As far as what format you want, what bit depth, what file format, um, what sampling rate, so on and so forth. Here's where you can put it on dither if you want to, where it saves to, and it'll dump it out. So that's you know. That's some simple stuff. I could also, maybe I just need to change the sampling rate of this. 
Like maybe she gave them in 48 and I need it in 44.1. So I could just pull it up here real quick and just do a quick render to 44.1 and save it. Okay. Um, maybe I just need to change the gain of it a little bit, right? I could just go to actions here. Uh, process, change, gain. I just need this to be, this whole thing to be 6 dB quieter for some reason. All right? Boom, render it. It's out. Um, you can also, maybe I just need to compress this. All right? Maybe it's too dynamic. and I just need to compress it because I'm having a hard time getting it to sit underneath the scene really well. And I don't really want to have to go all the way back to the logic session and figure out how all the submixes were done there to compress the whole thing. I can just load the audio file into here and do a quick compression plugin on it. So I can go in and pull up my um, my Renaissance compressor, drag that up onto the layer here, and it gets becomes one of the effects. And then I can open it up and here is, you know, I can manipulate this. So maybe And then I could render this. So do a quick render, out, so on and so forth. Um, all right, let me show you how to make the multi-channel files. And this is the part that I want you to do for over this during this week. I, I want you to go and take take something you've done in Logic. You've all done something in Logic, right? That has multiple channels. Um, Presumably, in Double David's things. class, right? A few things, maybe, right? Maybe a piece of music you've made, you know, whatever. Um, so instead of bouncing it down as a mix down, I want you to bounce it down as separate files, load it up in here, and make an inter multi channel interleave file with it, okay? That you could then load into Logic or into QLab and mess with it, okay? So I'll show you, I'll show you the process. Um, what's that? <laughs> So here is, uh, let's see if I can find one here. Here we go. Sorry, everything on my hard drive right now is 101 Dalmatians because that was the last show I did. In a few, in a few weeks, it's going to be Cat in the Hat. Oh, it wants my thunder. That's right, that's on my other drive. You know what I did learn from that project we did uh, just yesterday, today, whatever, is that there's a lot of things out there that I really want to buy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's nothing so is distracting. There's a lot of things that I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, like this. I was getting so distracted just because I was like, this is crazy. This is crazy. Let me try this again. Yeah, you can get ripped off really easily out there. All right, so this is something that the orchestrator sent me um, for this particular show, and that has all of the different um, channel, the different instruments on it. Okay, um, and then I added some stuff to it. So I went in, recorded um, the singer singing some on over it right here, and then I've got my thunders in here too uh, that I put in. So this is a whole. <laughs> Okay. Um, but anyway, each thing is, oops. Right, each little, where's the clarinet? There it is. Okay. But remember, I wanted, what? So I remember, remember, I wanted to get this as an interleave file into QLab so that I could do mixes. So I could, if I just did a bounce here, I'd get, you know, two channels and I'd be stuck with that mix. I don't want to do that. So, because uh, I want to add the reverb live and all kinds of stuff too, because I wanted to have the same reverb 
on these instruments that I was putting live on the vocals so that it sounded like it was the same room. So I don't want to dump my own this reverb down in here. Uh, so there's a few ways you could go about this. Um, what did the show did you have to? What did they want in the show that made you have to record on? No. What do you mean? Didn't you have an orchestra? No. No, it was all can. Were they actually going to play that as part of the public performance? That right yeah. Yeah, she's using. Um, she was using Mach Five, I think, to do this. It sounds. It's. I tell you, it got a lot better. This is the other reason why I multi-channeled it because if I when I take it into the space, um, because I could put live reverb on it and I could kind of mix it around to different last speakers, it got a lot better. Made a huge difference in, in the quality. Um, this was, I mean, I had no control over this. This, this part was somebody else's job, and she just handed it to me, and I had to make it work. So that was a big reason, because I heard it too, and I was like, mm -hmm. it's okay, I guess, but it could be better. But I, I purposely asked her, I said, give it to me dry. So I don't want any, I don't want you to do any reverb on it, no anything, just give me the raw audio, and then I'll make it work in the space. And Because she had really crappy reverbs on it from Mark 5 and everything. Thing. So anyway, that's that like a split production show or something. Like it was a premiere. This was a new musical. So they, they had uh, the composer was writing the music when well, she was writing the songs basically, and then they hired this other lady, an orchestrator, to do all of this uh, to orchestrate all the songs and create all the transition music and everything. And she was doing that all on her computer. She lives in Arizona somewhere. Um, and she was sending dropboxing this stuff to me, uh, and then my job was to make it work in the space. So, and you know, every time they would want to rewrite a song, I had to do this all over again. <laughs> so, you won't do that a lot, though. yeah. In fact, the second so we did this in two cities. We did it once in Charlotte and once up in D.C. And in D.C., they were doing so many changes so often that I had to abandon the notion of the multi-channel playback because I, I couldn't turn it around fast enough. And so we kind of had to, to punt and go back to the mix downs because um, just they were changing so many things so rapidly we just didn't have the time to, to wrangle it like this. So, so there was we sacrificed some quality by doing that, but it was what we had to do. All right, so um, in this, there's a couple of ways to go about this. In this particular uh, way, uh, because I'm not doing any processing on any of these. I mean, I was literally just pulled this in. This is what she sent me was this file. Um, I can really, I can just do an export of the audio regions, export them to files. Um, the other way to do it would be to solo this and bounce, and then solo that and bounce, solo this and bounce. You know, if you've got live effects or something that you want to have plugins or something running on it. Um, and you probably do in most cases. Uh, so you would just solo each track, bounce it one at a time, so on and so forth. Yeah, and that's so that's essentially what. Yeah, yep, you're right. Yep, that would do it. And that's kind of what I did. So I ended up, um, I believe, going in here and. Uh, I did a convert um, audio region to new audio file, and it would then save these. I could say what folder I wanted them in, and it would save them as separate files. Um, but yeah, you could do a bounce to track, and that would do it too. Um, I've never I've never done it that way, but yeah, that would work. Um, let's see. So if we do bounce, yeah, do a bounce in place. You could do that uh, per region. Well, that depends where your reverb. I mean, that depends on where your desk is laid out. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So wh whatever you've got to do to get out what you want. This, but if you do a bounce in place, what it'll do is it'll do a bounce and make an audio file of that, right? And then you could go and get that out of the folder. Okay. But it won't include like if your re reverb is on an aux. So yeah. If your reverb's on an aux or something, then no, it wouldn't. Um, so yeah, you, you have to figure out how you're going to do it. But ultimately, the goal here is to not spit out a mix down. The goal is to spit out each track as its own thing. So what I ended up with then is, um, let's see, I think I ended up putting it over here. 
working multis. No. Where did I put it? It's been a few weeks since I was <laughs> on this thing. No, it's got to be in there. No, it's not. Plans. Oh, there it processed. That's where I put it. I put it in the folder down there. So, because each there's actually multiple queues in here, um, you can see she's cut them up. You know, because we would use the same theme other places. So that's why I had to do it that way. So here it is. I've got the original one. The I've got plans, and uh, you know, here's all of the files. And I, I have a, I. This is just a weird thing I was having. I was actually putting out some two channel files, so I ended up doing mono. So I have. Uh, Here's my, each, each audio file is a separate thing. So I can get rid of logic now. Save. And I'll go into Triumph. And I'll put these in here. And I'm dying to find somebody who can write me an Apple script to automate this. Because um, I haven't figured out how to do it yet. But. I need somebody to. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'll just take... Uh, there's a few ways to go about this. Uh, I'll put this one in here. The merging of, into, of it into separate things. This is all the tempo markings that were in Logic that it, that it bounced down. So I'm just going to delete all of those because um, it slows it down if I leave all those in. All right, so there's my bassoon. Oops. All right. Uh, so uh, if I open up my channels view, I can then take my my Celeste in here. Take these. And there's a couple of ways you can go about it. What you can do is in each layer, you can make however many channels you want, and then you just specify which channel you know each thing is out of, or you can put them all into one layer, which is what I'll show you here. So here on this one, I'm going to make a new layer, or a new channel, okay? And then uh, go over here to this, this Celeste layer, select that, and I'll just copy it, and then go over here, and if I turn on my separate channel selection. Now I can select that second channel separately and I'll just double click to select all of that and then paste that in. And now it's on a separate one. See that? And then I can get rid of this layer. So I'll get the clarinet now. Get rid of all these tempo markings. So this is the kind of stuff a sample editor is good for, is cleaning up the audio files, getting rid of the crud, <laughs> organizing stuff. Um, it seems tedious here. Imagine trying to do something like this in logic. It would, it would be a nightmare. It, in fact, some of it you couldn't even do. Yeah, so I'll do it again. So uh, I'll go back to my original uh, layer here. I'm going to add a new channel down here in channels. So now I've got an empty one. Then I'll go to my clarinet. Select it, copy, go back to my, my main layer where I'm putting it all together, and I'll double click in my, extra, my empty channel and paste that in. And let me open this up so you can see a little bit better. And then I can delete this other layer here. I'm just right-clicking on there to delete that. So you can see I'm starting to build this multi-channel thing here. Okay, so now I'll take my drums, put that in here, and I'll get rid of my markers. So in your logic file, you may end up with markers like that if you're doing a lot of the tempo changes or something. Logic like tags it with that, which is useful if you bring it back into logic because then it'll chase that information. That's the whole real-time 
pitch and time stretching stuff that they do. They do it with markers. Uh, all right, I make a new layer. Go over here. Get my drum. Select my empty layer. Paste it in. So on and so forth. And you keep going until you get them all in there. And then what you need to do is in each one of these channels now, you have to give them their own output. So this one will go out to channel one. This will go out to channel two. This will be channel three. This will be channel four. If you don't do that, then it won't it won't flatten them to as separate things. So if you have them all going out to channel one and you do a flatten, it's going to flatten it as a monofile. It'll be it'll be a four channel file, but everything will be in it'll be everything will be dumped on the one channel, and you'll have three empty ones. What's that? Yeah, exactly. And that's happened to me before. I've forgotten to do that, and I bounce it out, and I get a multi-channel file, but only one of the channels has audio on it, and it's all the same. You know? <laughs> And then I like to go ahead and name these things, because just, I don't know, exactly. So this is my bassoon channel. This is where if you wanted to reorder them, you could do that here. Um, this is my Celestia. This is my clarinet. This is my drums. And then again, the abbreviations are not critical. Um, but I like to go ahead and put them in anyway, just to be sure. You can put anything you want in here. It just needs to be something short. So I just put numbers or letters or whatever. So now that I've got that, now I can go in and render this thing. So I render this, go to next, or whatever format you want, AAFF, WAVE, Sound Designer, CAF, whatever you want to do. Um, it's 16 bit, 48 kilohertz was the source. So I don't see, and I don't have any need to change that, so I'll just leave it. Um, and here's where you can apply a dither if you really want to. Um, and there's all different, there's two different types of dithering algorithms they have here that you can use. All right, so I'm going to call this my uh, 101 multi demo. And we'll put it on Why don't you Richard. Add, like, tell us two people who did it. Like last class, you basically explained to us why, how we did it was useful, but you still always are like, yeah, if you want to. Well, <laughs> so scientifically, it's useful. Practically, I have been in very few situations where I've noticed the difference. If you're making something for somebody who's got a very, very good ear, and is really going to care about this kind of stuff, then dither it. <laughs> or if for some reason you're mixing it at very, very low levels. So if you're if you're running this at very, very low levels and really long fade outs of, on stuff that's really low level to begin with, the dither can help you in that situation. But I'm usually, I'm really, really uh, paranoid about my gain structure. <laughs> and so I tend to be mixing and operating it pretty hot levels and dither never really becomes a factor for me because I'm not using those <laughs> that that lower level. All right, so I'm going to render this. Uh, it dumps it over here to my renders, but part of that was also saving it. So if I go over here over to Richard, we should see it now. There is my 101 multi demo. Now, if I pull that into QLab, should give me all the channels. Yes, I know. There you go, four channels, and this is one of my one of my feature. When I visited Figure Fifty Three last two months ago, I, I want them to give me labels for these so I can know what each of these are because you don't know. Yeah. Um, question: What what's the difference between AIF and RAID? So, back in the day when uh, Max used PowerPC processors, processors and Windows used x86 processors, the fundamental difference between those two processors is the bit order, okay? Uh, and the, um, the x86 processors counted the least significant bit first. So if, if you're thinking, we'll learn more about binary in a couple of weeks, but you've got bits, right? Zeros and ones, zeros and ones. And different, you know, a zero or a one, the one could represent one or it could represent 65,000. 
right? It just depends. So what happens is with x86 processors, it reads them in the order of the least significant bit first. So it, when it's reading that stream of numbers, it's reading the smallest value numbers first and goes in ascending order. PowerPC processors ran them most significant bit first. So it, it would read them backwards. This is also called uh, little endian, big endian, as in the end of the file. Okay. Uh, so if you ever hear it referred to the file format as it, th this file format is in little endian format, they're talking about the bit order. It was encoded to have the least significant bits read first. Okay. Uh, so the difference between AIFF and WAVE is that AIFF is encoded most significant bit first. WAVE is, is encoded least significant bit first because they were intended to be read. WAVEs would be read by x86 processors and AIFFs would be read by PowerPC processors, which is why WAVE was the native audio file format for Windows and AIFF was the native file format for Mac back in the days when they used different processors. Now that they both use the same processors, it doesn't matter. And all of the audio software just has a little bit of code that tells the processor how to read it. So it'll tell the processor, hey, read this AIFF backwards, and then it'll be right. <laughs> so aside from that, there's no difference at all. Um, do, we, do we encounter situations where that affects us? Um, I have found uh, that sometimes the metadata is not read consistently. So the audio is the same, but all of the markers and loop points and comments and stuff that you can embed in the file, some programs are not will not read that act that all of that data that metadata incorrectly for for both Wave and AIFF the same way. So. Uh, like QLab does this. It won't read loop markers on AIFF files, but it will read them on waves. But it'll read marker markers on both file types. So there's something about how that's encoded that they're just not reading it. That's the only time I've ever, I've ever run into the problem. But as far as the bit order problem, no, that's largely been solved. Okay. okay. Um, all right, we're out of time. Long since out of time. Sorry about that. Uh, so what I would like you to do uh, between now and Friday is go get one of your logic projects and do this. So bounce it down as separate tracks and see if you can make yourself a multi-channel audio file in Triumph. Uh, multi-channel interleaved audio file, just to try and do it. Okay. And on Friday, you know, if you get stuck and you couldn't figure it out, then I'll look and see what you were doing wrong. Is Triumph the end result or QLab the end result? I mean, you know, we can test it by loading it up into QLab to see if it worked, but QLab is not. I mean, QLab is not the point. Triumph is the point. Okay, so I just want you to make the audio file and see if you can make one that has. By the way, if you if you don't want to test it in QLab, once you've rendered that down, you can pull it back into Triumph, and Triumph should show you all all the channels on the file. Okay, so just try to do that over the, over the now Friday. Come into the lab. Right? Triumph's on here, or if you want to download the demo on your own computer, you can do that. Is it limited by that? Um, no. The stir is basically in release file. Right, but if I had like five channels on a CD, yeah, an audio CD would, would not read that. It wouldn't even play the first two. It would just not read. Well, I don't know. It might play the first two. I don't think. I don't think so. It would fail. That that CD would fail verification because it wouldn't follow the reference standard. Oh, okay. So we'll play with Triumph some more on Friday. I'm not expecting you guys to get like you know happy power users in Triumph. What well, I was looking at. I just want you to be familiar with the concept of. You get more than one license, it's eight dollars cheaper. But I think if you get five users, <laughs> you get two licenses, it's eight. It's it's eight dollars cheaper. Yeah, but would they let you share that code? Dude, that's what it is. Five users, you're selecting. Yeah, no, but they're raising your price. Yeah, but I, what I mean that that that's, one code. that tends to be one code that would be in like a lab like this. So you would need to call them to find out. Hey, could I like share that code? Kind of purchase. Okay, I have, yeah. I have some iTunes money that needs. <laughs> you don't have to buy it. It's here. You can use it. I know, I have, but I'm not going to use it for anything else. Yeah, I absolutely want to buy this. <laughs> okay. and, I, and I did not tell you to buy it. I want to make that perfectly clear. I don't want to get in trouble. School. <laughs> what's the, what's the procedure for using this? Uh, do I have to pay for it? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, I can get you a network account, um, but you can always log in with the name Sound. Yes. Sound. Sure. Yeah. Sound. <laughs> so it all else fails. Yeah, so you can bring a hard drive in and plug it in. Uh, there's FireWire here. Is there a FireWire with here if you want it? Sure. Um, you can also go into the backup. Uh -huh. yeah. So there's several USBs here. Okay. Um, there's also some more on the back. There's another FireWire and stuff on the back of this. Oh, uh, they're changing? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So not all the workstations have the two monitors, but some of them do. Uh, but it goes out through this. So to control the volume, you can put it here and just tap the little thing until it shows the speaker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, come in, yeah, I, uh, hopefully your car will start working today, and then you can come in and do it. Or if you want, you can just download the demo of trying yeah. to get you through the week. If you use that a lot. I used to have Soundforge, a hot version, but if you use that a lot, I'm switching to Mac. If you use that a lot, I'll put my 80 bucks. I, I use it. I use it quite a lot. Um, I, 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 I have found reasons to use it. Um, that being said, I mean you can you can certainly get by just fine without this kind of tool. Mm -hmm. But I find this kind of tool. There's things that it does really well that are much harder to do in other things. A lot of people use this as a master tool. Really? Um, they, I, I definitely need this. It, it, it's, got, it's got a lot, of, and that's what we're going to look at Friday. It's using it as a mastering tool. Um, it's, it's really good for that. 